Well, praise the living God and uh, welcome to our presentation uh, this hour. We are going through the series, The Prophets and the Messengers. And uh, these uh, current topics that we are handling are uh, an appeal to common sense. And uh, I was able to do in the previous pre presentation the qualifications of a minister and how they should be uh, the responsibility of the church, uh, making sure that uh, they are qualified to be sent out to minister. Uh, in this hour, I'm going to deal with, uh, as I promised in this presentation, the wife of the minister, those who have presented themselves to minister work, how should their wives be? Now, I understand this is a delicate issue, but I pray that the Lord may help us to hear and listen and uh, be able to be benefited rather than to take it as uh, a negative things to hear such a things. And so um, without much, um, I'd like to pray just to give God thanks and glory for the things that uh, he is doing for us. And then uh, I'll be able to enter into the presentation. Our Heavenly Father, Thou knoweth our hearts, and uh, if they are true to the message or if they are not true. And Lord, where they have not been true, bring about uh, a true conversion. That Lord, we may not have a lip service, but uh, we may have uh, a practical aspect of these truths that we are presenting. And so give us a humble heart and a heart of flesh that uh, is able to receive the things of heaven for spiritual things are spiritual design. Bless your people and more so the women in ministry. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And so uh, the wife of a minister, what kind of uh, a woman should she be? Some will ask, and uh, I'll go straight away to the questions that really arise. What if I have a wife who doesn't have uh, my objectives? She can't buy into that. Yet I'm called into ministry. Shall I not work for the Lord because my wife does not meet the minimum or maximum qualifications of uh, a minister's wife? And some have come into truth when they were already married and uh, their marriage was not that um, per se a marriage that uh, we could say in human eyes it was a good marriage. We, we understand those things. There are people who have been caught up in situations before they got the truth and now they are in truth and uh, they have gifts. Should they work for the Lord? Should not they, should not they work for the Lord? Uh, I want to say in a very humble way that uh, I do not have an answer for that. Uh, to judge on anyone whose wife really does not meet the minimum qualities to be a wife of a minister, I don't have an answer of what the man should do. My um, main focus is just to present what the Bible says and the spirit of prophecy and not to go into those specifics because sometimes ministers have made statements and in the past, I included, we have made statements that have left uh, the hearts of people bitter and uh, they have even caused people to try to think about divorcing their spouses because uh, they, they are not up to uh, what the standard of the Bible calls. Not because we or I specifically said that they should divorce. I am one of the people who will never advocate for divorce. I, I leave the matter with the couples to do what they want to do. I am not a marriage counselor, by the way. And um, I, I, I prefer people reading their Bibles and understanding their obligations 
rather than um, advising this and that, although we have been caught up in situations where you hate to say your views, not your opinion, but uh, how you understand the Bible says, and this have brought a lot of uh, uh, dangerous decisions, which the advice did not intend for such a decisions to be made. But then we just pray that the Lord may forgive us sometimes for the rash uh, advices, and more so the situations where people come and uh, they are single, they do not come the the two couples uh, or the couple i mean and so you give an advice to one without considering the other should have been present and so you find out oh i just really messed up uh, i could have even if this story is true the other party should have been there so that uh, whatever i say it may not be that i incited the wife or i incited the husband to do this and this but uh, it was uh, a counsel to the whole family so on this issue of uh, the, the, the the qualities of the wife of the minister, I'm not giving specifications for what people should be doing. I'm simply I'm simply presenting what the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. The reason I spend much in this is that uh, somebody will watch the presentation and say, you see what the minister said? And uh, by the way, I don't call self uh, a minister, but uh, um, God has given me a gift of... Um, publishing and authoring articles and uh, these articles are what I'm uh, turning into videos this year the whole of this year I'm dedicated to this I'm not a preacher I'm not a minister I'm not a pastor I'm not an elder I'm not an evangelist I'm a person who loves the bible I love writing Christian articles and publishing them so my point is this uh, don't take these materials to be materials for doing some specific things i'm laying down the principles as they are found in inspiration it is you to sit down with your spouses and know what to do and so uh, i just wished i could say that because i don't want somebody to pick the presentation and say start using it as a as ledger hammer to their spouses that uh, this you should be this you should be this that is not how christianity is worked out uh pause is the last resort of every false religion. If you can't win somebody by love, don't try forcing them. You will never achieve anything by forcing your child, by forcing your husband, or by forcing your wife to do something. The least you can do is to pray for these people. In fact, before I just start the presentation and uh, uh, through the Spirit, God is reminding me just to put this across uh, before I start fully the presentation. I, I like to put something on the uh, on the screen. It should be from two SG if uh, I'm not wrong. Uh, Um, if not from 2SG, I'll get it from another place. Uh, and be able to share with us. Oh, so what if these people can't work with you? That is what I just want to uh, want to start with. What if your spouse can't walk this narrow pathway? <clears throat> And uh, forgive me for taking long in this. We are told that um, you have a consolation that uh, they do not have. Mm.
Ah. Yeah, I have it. I have it in uh, live sketches of James White and E.G. White. But um uh, is somewhere where There is somewhere actually where it is much better. Just give me a moment. Yeah, to SG266. Thank you for your patience. To SG266. Uh, to SG266. Here is what it reads. I just want to put this disclaimer before I start the presentation. It is worth beginning with the Lord has reminded me about it. I saw that those who profess the truth should hold the standard high and induce others to come up to it. I saw that some will have to walk the straight path alone. Their companions and children will not walk the self-denying pathway with them. Patience and forbearance should ever characterize the lives of those lone pilgrims following the example of their blessed master. They will have many trials to endure, but they have a hope that makes the soul strong, that bears them up above the trials of earth, that elevates them above scorn, derision, and reproach. Those who possess a hope like this should never indulge a harsh, unkind spirit. This will only injure their own souls and drive their friends further from the truth. Treat them tenderly, give them no occasion to reproach the cause of Christ, but never yield the truth to please anyone. Be decided, be fixed, be established, be not of doubtful uh, of doubtful mind. And uh, I, I think this is a most important thing to consider. Don't be of a doubtful mind if you have unbelieving relatives. She continues to say, but uh, if but if your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield to the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible. I don't think a divorce can make this plausible or feasible. For all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. So if you can't win your children, if you can't win your wife, if you can't win your husband, if you cannot make them yield to the claims of truth, you, you know, let me just pause. A lot of time we have lacked happiness and um, despaired and even thought about suicide because our children are not hearing the truth. Our wives are not listening to the truth. Our husbands are not yielding to the truth. We are being told, brothers and sisters, mark this statement, but if your companions and children will not come, it is not a must everyone will come to the truth. Think of Nabal and Abigail. Think of the Bible characters whom you know that has been so pious, but their children and uh, their spouses never yielded to the truth. Think about Jacob's family. If you were part of that family, what will you do? Continued on. But if your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible. Don't make it a hell. Don't use the word of God as a sledge hammer and uh, E.G. White's writing as a sledge hammer. For all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. Let them enjoy it. But let not your duty to them interfere with your duty to God. Pursue a straightforward course. Now, this balance is where we, th this is the balance that always we miss. Make their lives here as pleasant as possible, but let not your duty to the duty to them interfere with your duty to God. Finding this balance is what has really been a problem with many families. Pursue a straightforward course. Let nothing they may do or say provoke an angry word from you. 
you have a hope that will yield to yield you consolation amid the disappointments and trials of life. Your companions and children who will not be induced to tread the narrow cross-bearing pathway with you have not this divine consolation. They should have your pity for this world is all the heaven they will ever have. And this point has always been my cutting point that um, if you knew that this world is the only heaven that your child will ever have, how will you treat that child? The child who has refused to yield to the truth and you are told this is the only heaven he will ever have. What kind of pity will you have on your spouse and your child if that were the case? Think for a moment about that. I was shown that all who profess the present truth will be tested and tried. Their love for Jesus coming will be proved and manifested to others, whether it is genuine. All... Um, all I saw will not stand the test. Some love this world so much that it swallowed up, it's it swallows up their love for the truth. As their treasures here increase, their interest in the heavenly treasures decrease. The more they possess of this world, the more closely do they hug it to them, and as if fearful, their coveted treasure will be taken from them. The more they possess, the less do they have to bestow upon others. For the more they have, the poorer they feel. Oh, the deceitfulness of riches. They will not see and feel the ones of the cause of God. And uh, talk about uh, Lord's wife. And so let me leave this issue of family life alone, but it is part of what I'm going to present, the wife of a minister. What kind of a person are the people expecting you to be? Even if the husband can't change you, but know what people are expecting from you. Don't say that... Uh, don't have this statement that uh, don't look un unto me, look unto Jesus Christ. There is nothing like that, brothers and sisters, that uh, you are telling people, don't look to me, look to Christ. It is true people should not be looking to people and Christ is a man who uh, 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 actually leans on the arm of flesh. But then, are we not supposed to be examples, actually? Hasn't God called us to be Christians, to be examples? Has he called us so that people may not look unto us? Why take the name Christ or Christian Christian, when uh, actually you don't want to represent to be an emblem of that word? So a wife of a minister. We looked at uh, the ministers themselves and it is prudent we look at the wives how they should be. In order for a man to be a successful minister, something more than book knowledge is essential. And we can say in order for a woman to be a successful minister, something more than book knowledge is essential. The laborer for souls need consecration, integrity, intelligence, industry, energy, and tact. Possessing this qualification, no man can be inferior. Instead, he will have a commanding influence for good. This is both men and women. But let us now venture into this issue of uh, a wife of a minister and her behavior. In 1 Timothy 3.1, we read the qualification of a man, but when you go to verse 11, we are told the, the, the women of these ministers or the wife of a minister, even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons to be the husbands of one wife ruling their children and their own house as well. So also the wife, must be ruling her, the wife of a minister must be ruling her house well, lest she shall be a bad example to the people. This wife, we are told she must be grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things, because automatically, and it should be automatically, some people say it should not be, it's not automatic, but it should be automatic when a man enters into the ministry, the woman uh, uh, qualifies to be uh, uh, a ministress, by the way. And so the things that uh, are feminine that the man should have handled, the wife is the one who should be handling, and uh, the secrets of the people should remain within the family circle. Instead of the man going to a family and then he meets a feminine issue and he has to call upon others and you will never know now who spread the matter to others when it goes out. But if it is within the family circle, Either the husband is the one who is talking about the issue or the wife is the one who is talking about the issue. And so the qualification that the men have are the same qualification their wives should have, even though they may not call themselves ministers of the word. Again, in Titus chapter 2, we read that um, 
uh, after talking about the men who should become sound in doctrine, be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience, after talking about this man, then follows this statement. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husband, that the word of God be not blasphemed. And so these women should be, the wives of the ministers should be obedient to their husbands. And for what reason? That the word of God be not be blasphemed. And how is the word of God blasphemed if the wife of the minister is not a holy person? The people say, this minister cannot control his own house. How will he be able to manage the church of God? if he has been not been able to manage his own house. And so the word of God does meet with difficulties when the wife of the minister does not respond to her office too. Continued on in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 to 12. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old, having been a wife of one man, well reported of good works, if she have brought up brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work, but the younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to work wanton against Christ, they will marry. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, this is one department that uh, many churches and uh, self-supporting ministries do not have. Aged women who can be able to guide the younger women to love, to cherish, and to uh, um, guide their house into righteousness. Sister White says that um, the work of a woman is to Christianize a nation. Think of higher, what a higher calling that she has. She doesn't say that the wife of a minister, she says the work of a wife is to Christianize a nation. From her home comes that um, a, 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 a person that goes to meet with different people. And if she has not played her duty, there from that home comes children. If she has not played her duty, this man will have a wrong influence upon the people and the children will have a wrong influence to the society. What a grave responsibility that a woman has. And now more so that she is a wife of a minister. What even a graver responsibility that she has. That uh, she has to be sober, able to teach as we are told, and able to guide her house. And then she should be one that can be able to guide younger women to be responsible to their husbands. Now, if uh, the wife of the minister has not learned to respect the husband, to be responsible with the children, how will she be able to guide the younger women to be responsible to their husband and to raise up their children in the admonitions of the Lord? We are talking about the wife of a minister and her behavior. Again, we continue reading. In uh, June 5, 1863, Sister White was shown something that uh, Satan is ever at work uh, to dishearten. Satan is ever at work to dishearten. And uh, the most uh, close instrument that Satan can use to dishearten is the woman. Now, you, you, you have not to view me as a feminist, a person against females. And when I talk about uh, what happened in the Garden of Eden, but I'll not go there because you know it. But he says that a woman in Satan's hand is a very successful instrument to bring down many people. But the same woman in the hands of God is a tool that no one can match also. 
and this is a statement that uh, we can read over and over again, but uh, I encourage you to study this issue of a wife of a minister. I just lay, laying down a very few things. In uh, June 5, 1863, I was shown that Satan is ever at work to dishearten and lead astray ministers whom God has chosen to preach the truth. The most effectual way in which he can work is through home influences, through unconsecrated companions. We are looking at the wife of a minister and her behavior. We have looked at the qualifications in the previous presentation about men, their qualifications and their behavior. And now we are looking at the wife of a minister. Even if she is not a preacher, what kind of a woman ought she to be? And so... If, if he can control the mind of the wife, he can, through her, the more readily gain access to the husband, who is laboring in word and doctrine to save souls. Many have disregarded the sacred obligation resting upon them to improve the light and privileges given, and walk as children of the light. If the veil could be parted and all could see just how their cases are regarded in heaven, there will be an awakening, and each would, each would with fear inquire, what shall I do to be saved? Gospel Workers, 1892 edition, page 209, paragraph 2. The minister's wife, who is not devoted to God, is no help to her husband. Now, that is a very strong statement, and uh, this is coming from uh, page 210, paragraph 1, Gospel Workers, 1892 edition. She says, the minister's wife, who is not devoted to God, is no help to her husband. She is not saying the woman who is not a preacher, but a woman who is not devoted to God. Here we are not talking about women preaching, the wife, the minister's wife being a preacher. We are talking about just a minister's wife and her behavior. While he dwells upon the necessity of bearing the cross and urges the importance of self-denial, the daily example of his wife often contradicts his preaching and destroys it is force. In this way, she becomes a great hindrance and often lead leads her husband away from his duty and from God. She does not realize what a sin she is committing. Instead of seeking to be useful, seeking with true love for souls to help such as need help, she shrinks from the task and prefers a useless life. She is not constrained by the power of Christ to love, Christ's love and by unselfish holy principles. She does not choose to do the will of God to be a co-worker with her husband, with angels and with God. When the wife of the minister accompanies her husband in his mission to save souls, it is a great sin for her to hinder him in his work by manifesting unhappy discontent. Yet, instead of entering, entering heartily into his labors, seeking every opportunity to unite her interest and labor with his, she often studies how she can make it more easy or pleasant for herself. If things around them are not as agreeable as she could wish, as they will not always be, she should not indulge homesick feelings or by lack of cheerfulness and by spoken complaints harass the husband and make his task harder, and perhaps by her discontent draw him from the place where she could do good. She should not divert the interest of her, of her husband from laboring for the salvation of souls, to sympathize with her ailments and gratify her whimsical, discontent feelings. If she will forget herself and labor to help others, talk and pray with poor souls and act as if their salvation was of higher importance than any other consideration, she would have no time to be homesick. She would feel from day to day a sweet satisfaction as a reward for unselfish labor. I cannot call into sacrifice. I cannot call it sacrifice. For some of our minister's wives do not know what it is to sacrifice or suffer for that truth's sake. And so we are being told that if the minister will carry such a wife along, that um, it will be a, a, a double work. For she will create a homesick environment and then deter the wife from ministering in the uh, for for the people who are uh, 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 burdened with uh, the life's problem. Now, I want to give you an example of uh, one woman who never gave 
the husband a good time in public and this man was a minister now some of you may be shocked some will not be shocked but i'm talking about mary loboro uh, 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 uh the wife of uh, uh john loboro now that name is familiar with adventists that uh listen to what uh, sister white had to cancel her because she was not behaving like a minister's wife dear mary let your influence tell for god you must take a position to exert an influence over others to bring them up in spirituality we have just read and i'll, I'll go back to something here so that when i read this statement of mary it should sing in better let me go back here that um when the wife of the minister accompanies her husband in his mission to save souls, it is a great sin for her to hinder him in his work by manifesting unhappy discontent. If things around them are not as agreeable as she could wish, as they will always be, she should not indulge homesick feelings or by lack of cheerfulness and by spoken complaints harass the husband and make his task harder and perhaps by her discontent draw him from the place where he could do good. Now, Mary tried to do this on John uh, Lobora, and uh, this is what Sister White had to tell her. Dear Mary, let your influence tell for God. You must take a position to exert an influence over others to bring them up in spirituality. You must guard yourself against following the influence of those around you. If others are light and tripling, be grave, and Mary, suffer me a little upon this point. She, she tells Mary, listen to me now. I wish in all sisterly and motherly kindness to kindly warn you upon another point. I have often noticed before others a manner you have in speaking to John in a rather dictating manner, the tone of your voice sounding impatient. Mary, others notice this and have spoken of it to me. It hurts your influence. We women must remember that God has placed us. Now, we women, who are these women? E.G. White? The wife of Lobora, the wife of Andrews, or Jane Andrew, the wife of Uriah Smith, the wife of any minister. It doesn't matter if you are a prophetess or whatever calling that you have as a woman. He says, we women must remember that God has placed us subject to the husband. And she counts herself. He is the head and our judgment and views and reasoning we must agree with his if possible. If not, the preference in God's word is given to the husband where it is not a matter of conscience. If the husband is not telling you to sin, Sister White is saying, may you yield to his decision. If it's not going to lead to sin, if it is not impairing your individuality and your conscience, the Lord has placed men above women. And this is not to say, after sin, but even before sin. This is the hierarchy of heaven. This is patriarchal uh, uh, leadership. And so here Mary is being warned and other women, and it's E.G. White including herself. She's, she continues say, to say, we must yield to the head. I have said more perhaps upon this point than necessary. Please watch this point. I am not reproving you, remember, but merely cautioning you. Never talk to John as though he were a little boy. You reverence him and others will take an elevated position. Mary and you will elevate others. Seek to be spiritually minded. We are doing work for eternity. Mary, be an example. We love you as one of our children and I wish so much that you and John may prosper. Be of good courage. Trust in the Lord at all times. He will be your stronghold and you are delivered to Mary Love Borough, June 6, 1861. Now just meditate upon that, those words. This is a prophetess, a message of the Lord, speaking to the wife of a minister who was not showing a good example. We are looking at the wife of the minister and her behavior. Going back to my notes. Now, in former years, the wives of ministers endured one and persecution. When their husbands suffered imprisonment and sometimes death, those noble, self 
sacrificing women's suffered with them and their reward will be equal to that bestowed on the husband miss bodman and miss judson's suffered for the truth suffered with their companions they sacrificed home and friends in every sense of the word to aid their companions in the work of enlightening those who sat in darkness to reveal to them the hidden mysteries of the word of god their lives were in constant peril to save souls was their great object and for this they could suffer cheerfully that is page 211 paragraph 1 gospel workers 1892 edition paragraph 2 says i was shown the life of christ when his self-denial and sacrifice is compared with the trials, trials and sufferings of the wives of some of our ministers it causes anything which they may call sacrifice to sink into insignificance if the minister's wife speaks words of discontent and discouragement the influence upon the husband is disheartening and tends to cripple him in his labor especially if his success depends upon surrounding influences. Now, you go to a place and uh, the people are just watching the family setup of the minister. And that alone can bring a success before he even speaks even a single sermon or teaches even one discourse. The way he orders his family and how the wife behaves can be a sermon that will lead someone into baptism water before even a single sermon is spoken. The person just looks at the wife of the minister or the husband, how he's treated the wife, he treats the wife, and then say, I'm going down to be baptized. If this is what Christianity can bring into family, I don't want to wait for a sermon here. I'm going straight away to the baptism water. But if that is what a, a surrounding and environment is awaiting for and then a family appears on the field a minister who is coming to minister and then they are quarreling with each other or they are behaving with each other as if they have never met christ in their life yet they want to bear eternal truth the fans will say now what is the importance of christianity if this is the way that uh, christianity has uh, uh, been uh, in this family and so even before the minister speaks one word, the minds of the people are locked and they cannot accept the truth. So if the environment depends on the deportment of the wife of the husband, how much should we be careful how we deal with each other? This is the wife of the minister and her behavior. Must the minister of God in such a cases be crippled or torn from his field of labor to gratify the feelings of his wife, which arise from an unwillingness to yield inclination to duty? The wife should conform her wishes and pleasures to duty and give up her selfish feelings for the sake of Christ and the truth. Satan has had much to do with controlling the labor, lab, labors of the ministers through the influence of selfish, is loving companions. Continued on, in that same, same book we are reading from page 9, uh, from page 210 to going uh, downward. If a minister's wife accompanies her husband in his travel, she should not go for her own special enjoyment, to visit and to be waited upon, but to labor with him. She should have a united interest with him to do good. She should be willing to accompany her husband if home cares do not hinder, and she should aid him in his efforts to save souls. With meekness and humility, yet with a noble self-reliance, she should have a leading influence upon minds around her, and should act her part and bear her cross and burden in meeting and around the family altar and in conversation at the fireside. The people expect this and they have a right to expect it. What are the people expecting? The wife of the minister to have a positive influence upon them, to talk to them besides the fireside when washing utensils, when they are gathered together in break times, they expect the minister's wife to talk to them a word of encouragement. And we are being told they have a right to expect this. Why? Because she is a minister's wife. Although she is not an active preacher, yet by her life, she is a, a preacher. And so we are told the people have a right to expect this from her. 
If these expectations are not realized, the husband's influence is more than half destroyed. So before he starts anything, or if he were in the midst of, midst of anything, her, her influence is half destroyed if the wife is not behaving in a way that uh, uh, is of positive influence. The wife of a minister can do much if she will. If she possesses the spirit of self-sacrifice and has a love for souls, she can with him do almost an equal amount of good. And so while she is just in the background doing her work and the minister preaching, they are doing equal work if the wife is positive in what the husband is doing. A sister laborer in the course of truth can understand and reach some cases especially among the sisters, that the minister cannot. And we are told feminine issues should be dealt with fe females and masculine issues with the male. And so a minister, although qualified for the work of God, cannot deal with all cases when it pertains to women. The, the wife of a minister should deal with that and the deaconesses should deal with that. A responsibility rests upon the minister's wife, which she should not and cannot lightly throw off. You know, let us be clear, because this has been the issue all time, that uh, my, my husband being a minister does not make me a minister. You hear such a careless statement being made by the wives of ministers that, you, you know, it is my husband who is a minister. He is the one who is gifted. I'm not a minister and uh, no one should be troubling me about these things. You, you know, may, may God forgive us for such a statements that we make as uh, a people uh, in Mosul. I'm talking about women. You, you should never let such a words come out of your lips that uh, it is your husband who was called to the ministry and uh, the people should uh, not lay a burden on you. A sister laborer in the course of truth can understand and reach some cases, especially among the sisters, that the minister cannot. A responsibility rests upon the minister's wife, which she should not and cannot lightly throw off. God will require the talent lend her with usury. She should work honestly, faithfully, and unitedly with her husband to save souls. She should never urge her wishes and desires or express a lack of interest in her husband's labor or dwell upon homesick, discontent, discontented feelings. All these natural feelings must be overcome. She should have purpose in life which should be unfalteringly carried out. What if this conflict with the feelings and pleasures and natural tests? This should be carefully and readily sacrificed in order to do good and save souls. The wives of ministers should live devoted, prayerful, lives. But some who will enjoy a religion in which there are no crosses and which calls for no self-denial and exertion on their part, instead of standing nobly for themselves, leaning upon God for strength and bearing their individual responsibility, they have much of the time been depended upon others, de deriving their spiritual life from them. If they will only lean confidently, confidingly in childlike trust upon God and have their affection centered in Jesus, deriving their life from Christ, the living vine, what an amount of good they might do, what a help they might be to others, what a support to their husband and what a reward will be theirs in the end. Well done, good and faithful servants who will fall like sweetest music upon their ears. The words enter thou into the joy of the Lord will repay them a thousand times for all suffering and trials endured to save precious souls. Now, somebody is asking, what does it mean a minister's wife feeling having homesick feelings now i may not under fully this but i want to say this what are homesick feelings the the, the things that you do at home maybe the, the the food that you take at home i like to take the food and the enjoyments and uh, the the comforts that you have at home these things should not be carried into the field of work like at your home you you can sleep on whichever kind of mattress you want you can sit on whichever chair you want. You can do anything that you want there. You can eat any food that you want as a minister's wife. But when you reach at the field and then 
maybe this is a poor fit and people don't have comfortable mattresses. I'm not saying that ministers should not be provided for comfortable mattresses. There are people who like picking ones. And um, they should be provided a, a good place. We should not also invite a brother to speak to us. And then we say, Christians are brethren. And so we will sleep on this chair because we are brethren. And we don't make any effort to make sure that they are comfortable. Remember, this minister has to study for the presentation. You can say that he, pre present, he, he prepared the slides when they were at home. No, he prepared the slides, but God may speak to him something else that he has to speak to the people. And he has to spend time in prayer. He has to restudy something. He has to, uh, to be comfortable because he will be standing for a longer time. And so we should do whatever we can to make sure ministers are comfortable. We should not just say we are brethren and uh, ministers should be should sleep even in the kitchen or whichever place because people are poor. No, that is not my point. My point is this. You can find yourself in a situation that you cannot help. You go to the field, no good water. The water is salt. And you are used to good water at your home. And people here cannot get good water. And you start complaining, this water is salty. I wish something could be done and all that. You may not have a good mattress and you say, we have traveled this far to come in this place so that you may just give us such and such a mattress. These are the things I'm talking about, homesick feelings. Or, uh, uh, yeah, certain foods prepared in a certain way. You know, you didn't send a cook there. And you should be a cook there. You should not go there to complain. How, how, how have you prepared this food? You are a minister's wife and you are complaining how people have prepared a food. Where were you when they were preparing? You should have been in that kitchen to help them prepare it. These homesick feelings, we are being told, leave them alone. And so we find ourselves in poor fields where we go to those fields and it is not the people who take care of you. You are the one who is to take care of them. Many cases coming to you as a minister and the wife of the minister, you have to provide for them. And at this moment to start manifesting homesick feelings, you, you will leave people asking, what is the work of a minister? Is he not a servant? that he should serve the people. Not that uh, they have, uh, they are laid back and they are doing nothing and they expect you to, to, to help, but they are doing their best, but their best, you are deeming them as unworthy. Those things you should keep to yourself and you should not indulge in homesick feeling when you are a wife of a minister, even if you are a minister. Eat with the people if it is possible and if the situation is like that. Sleep with where they have given you. Drink what they have uh, given you uh, if it will not uh, affect your health and uh, be able to do the work of God. And so the wife of a minister should not indulge in this homesick uh, uh, behavior. We are told a minister's wife should ever have a leading influence on the minds of those with whom she associates and she will be a help or a great hindrance. She either gathers with Christ or scatters abroad. A self-sacrificing missionary spirit is lacking among the companions of ministers. It is self first and then Christ secondly, and even thirdly. Never should a minister take his wife with him unless he knows that she can be a spiritual help, that she is one who can endure and suffer to do good and to benefit souls for Christ's sake. Those who accompany their husbands should go to labor united with them. They must not expect to be free from trials and disappointments. They should not think too much of pleasant feelings. What have feelings to do with duty? And uh, one asks, what about the wife of a minister is pregnant? I'm not talking about pregnant women. I'm talking about the wife of a minister. And... You, as you look at the, my background, it says an appeal to common sense. So that is something that um, will need common sense. How will you approach the issue if the wife of a minister is a pregnant woman? We are admonished that um, pregnant women, more so when they are about to give birth, they should not spend so much time by uh besides a lot of heat so you won't expect the wife of a minister to be going into the kitchen because now the inspiration says that she should involve herself actively in the work the common sense will tell us that uh, 
she shouldn't be at that place in the fireside. She can accompany the minister because there are reasons she they, they may give for her accompanying the minister. But then when she reaches there also, we should not say inspiration says this and this. We should balance everything. And uh, maybe the minister can travel with the wife because they have gone to a medical missionary camp and she wants the wife to be benefited with that medical missionary camp and uh, the treatments to continue. Let no one throw some words on her because she is not doing what a minister's wife should do. Uh, situations will alter circumstances will alter some things and that is what we call an appeal to common sense again we are told i was cited to this the case of abraham god said to him take now thy son thine own only son isaac whom thou lovest and get thee into the land of moriah and offer him there for a bond of offering upon one of the mountains which i will tell thee of Genesis 22, 2 and verse 11 and 12. Abraham obeyed God. He did not <laughs> consult his feelings, but with a noble faith and confidence in God, he prepared for his journey. With a heart rent with anguish, he beheld the proud, loving mother gazing with fond affection upon the son of promise, but he led that love, the son away. Now, uh, there's a, one time I read this statement in the somebody chuckled about it and it's something to chuckle about but it's a very very strong statement that uh, sister white makes here in gospel workers 1892 edition page 214 with a heart rent with anguish this is abraham he beheld the proud loving mother gazing with fond affection upon the son of promise but he led that loved son away. Now, there have been questions that has been raised in this statement. People have asked, did Abraham tell Sarah what he was going to do? I have been of the opinion he didn't tell this woman what he was going to do. But then, this is not dogmatic. If you have evidence that he told Sarah what she should do, I'm ready. And uh, it won't change our scientific uh, positions. But then, think about that. For Sister White to say that this woman was proud. And uh, what else? That uh, And what kind of pride she is talking here? You may say that she was proud because this was the only son. Not that pride of a sin, but uh, being proud that she had a child because it was in her old age. I don't want to misinterpret or to misrepresent what Sister White said. You, you can look into the story. But um, there is a way that Sarah loved Isaac in a very selfish way that even she could not put up with the Hagar son being with them. But Patriarchs and Prophet tells us that uh, 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 Ishmael was mocking uh, uh, um, Isaac. That is why actually Sarah had to send him away. But then this woman actually... Um, what if she had accompanied the husband and the husband held the knife up here to put on the heart of the child? What would have Sarah done? I don't know. Abraham suffered, yet he did not let his will rise in rebellion against the will of God. Duty, stern duty, controlled him. He dared not consult his feeling or yield to them for one moment. His only son walked by he, the side of the uh, his only son walked by the side of the stern, loving, suffering father, talking engagingly, uttering over and over the phone name of father, and then inquiring, where is the sacrifice? Oh, what a test for the faithful father. Angels looked with pleased wonder upon the scene. The faithful servant of God even bound his beloved son and laid him upon the wall. The knife was raised when an angel cried out, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thine hand upon the lad. And so, what lies in our hearts as... Um, the wives of the ministers. Is it pride that can prevent your husband from yielding to the obligations of God? We are given a story of uh, the wife of Moses. She prevented the husband from circumcising the firstborn, the, 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 the younger boy, 
to be part of the family of God. And then the angel met Moses on the way and he was about to slay him. And you know what? The wife had to do what she had prevented the husband from doing. She took a knife and circumcised the boy. A situation, a, a, a duty that was only for the male, now under a, a circumstance that could have costed somebody death, the woman had to do it. Will we wait until we are facing death to be the minister's wife that we should be? Ask, we can ask such a questions too. He says, I saw that it's no light thing to be a Christian. It is a small matter to profess the Christian name, but it's a great and sacred thing to lead a Christian life. So when the truth, the solemn important truth gets hold of them, self will die. When it gets hold of the women, or the minister's wife, they will die. Then the language will not be, I'll go there and I'll not stay there. But the honest inquiry will be, where does God want me to be? Where can I be best glorify him? And where can our united labor labors do the most good? Their will should be swallowed up in the will of God. The willfulness and lack of consecration that some of the minister's wives manifest will stand in the way of sinners. The blood of souls will be upon their garments. Some of the ministers have borne a strong testimony in regard to the duty and the wrongs of the church, but it has not had its designed effect. For their own companions needed all the straight testimony that had been borne, and the reproof came back upon themselves with great weight. They let their companions affect them and drag them down, prejudicing their minds and their usefulness and influence are lost. They feel desponding and disheartened and realize not the true source of the injury. It is close at home. These sisters are closely connected with the work of God if he has called their husbands to preach the present truth. These servants, if truly called of God, will feel the importance of the truth. They are standing between the living and the dead and must watch for souls as they that must give an account. Solemn is their calling and their companions can be a great blessing or a great curse to them. They can cheer them when desponding, comfort them when cast down, and encourage them to look up, up and trustful in God when their faith fails. Or they can take an opposite course, look upon the dark side, think they have a hard time, exercise no faith in God, talk their trials and unbelief to their companions, indulge a complaining, murmuring spirit, and be a dead weight and even a curse to them. I saw that the wives of the ministers should help their husbands in their labors and be exact and careful what in friend they exact, for they are watched and more is expected to them than of others. Their dress should be an example, their lives and conversation should be an example, severing of life rather than of death. Continued on, an unsanctified wife is the greatest curse that a minister can have. Those servants of God that have been and are still so unhappily situate, situated as to have this withering infant at home should double their prayer and their watchfulness. Take a firm, decided stand and let not this darkness press them down. They should cleave closer to God, be firm and decided, rule well their own house and live so that they can have the approbation of God and the watch care of the angels. But if they yield to the wishes of their unconsecrated companions, the frown of God is brought upon the dwelling. The ark of God cannot abide in the house because they countenance and uphold them in their wrongs. And so there is the answer. What if a minister has been called, but the wife is showing a wrong example? Let us read again what the minister should do. Their work is not to divorce and look in quotes for what is called a godly woman. That is not what God is calling them to do. He is saying that if these men find themselves in such a, such a situation, those servants of God, those servants of God that have been and are still so unhappily situated as to have this withering infant at home, should do what? Not divorce. Should double their prayers and their watchfulness take a firm decided stand and let not the darkness press them down 
They should cleave close to God, be firm and decided, rule well their own house and live so that they can have the approbation of God and the watch care of the angels. And the church should be careful now to start throwing words at these ministers that you know you cannot be a minister because your wife is not behaving well. No, that is not what God is telling the church to do to the minister. He is not telling the church to unemploy this minister. The church should, by prayer, accompany this minister into his labors. And the minister should double his prayer and maintain a true Christian spirit and let God approve of his work rather than the behavior of the woman or the wife hinder uh, uh, his work. And so in uh, bringing this to an end, in bringing this to an end, I'd like to find something. I think it is uh, in Adventist home. Um, if I find it good, if I don't find it better again, I'll be able to present it another time. Uh, in uh, pamphlet 63, uh, no, in in uh, pamphlet, page 63, paragraph 2 and 3. I'll uh, just share on the screen, pamphlet, page 63, paragraph 2, as we bring this to a close. Uh, Pam 63.2, look at this, about this minister, the minister's wives. Shun idolatry of dress. God wants beautiful character, not stylish appearance. Ministers and ministers' wives should be an example in reproving the fashionable display in our sisters who claim to believe the truth. Look at this. Ministers and ministers' wives should be an example in reproving their fashion, the fashionable display in our sisters who claim to believe the truth. They should have their children dressed in a way that will approve presenting them to the church in simplicity and modesty of apparel. Far greater pains should be taken to instruct them so that they should have beautiful characters and keep the way of the Lord than to have them make a stylish appearance, taking the way of the Sodomites. In paragraph 3, it says, Clothing should be plain, neat, comfortable, and of good material. Our ministers and their wives should be an example in plainness of dress. They should dress neatly comfortably wearing good material but avoiding anything like extravagant and trimmings even if not expensive for these things tell to our disadvantage we should educate the youths to simplicity of dress plainness with neatness let the extra trimmings be left out even though the cost be but a trifle and uh, somebody says i was not sharing the screen but i'll share it and repeat it this is a uh, pamphlet um, this is pastoral ministry, not pamphlet, sorry. Pastoral ministry. Thank you for that reminder. Pastoral ministry, page 63.2. I'm sorry, it's not pamphlet, but pastoral ministry, page 63.2 and 63.3. It says, I repeat, ministers and ministers' wives should be an example in reproving the fashionable display in our sisters who claim to believe the truth. They should have their children dressed in a way that would approve, presenting them to the church in simplicity and modesty of apparel. Far greater pains should be taken to instruct them so that they should have beautiful characters and keep the way of the Lord than to have them make a stylish appearance taking the way of the Sodomites. Again, our ministers and their wives should be an example in plainness of dress. They should dress neatly, comfortably wearing good material, but avoiding anything like extravagance and trimmings, even if not expensive, for these things will tell to our disadvantage. We should educate the youth to simplicity of dress, plainness with neatness. Let the extra trimmings be left out, even though the cost be but a trifle. That is Pastoral Ministry, page 63.3. And I encourage the pastors, ministers, and gospel workers and their wives to read the book Pastoral Ministry. And so I'd like to end at this point the wife of the minister and her behavior. God is calling you 
as a wife of a minister, even if you are not a preacher, to preach with your life. As we have seen the qualifications of a man who presents himself to preach, so if your wife, if your husband has been given a gift, the gift in Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, don't be the one who will hinder him for working for the Lord. Accompany him with your prayers. Accompany him with your character. And uh, be of a telling influence to the church of God. And to the church, we say this. Don't think that because the minister's, of, the minister's wife has failed to manifest what she should manifest, now that the minister is disqualified from preaching. Abigail was not disqualified from heaven because Nabal was a fool. And so the minister is not disqualified working if the wife becomes a fool too. An appeal to common sense. We should be a balanced people. We should have a mind of Christ. Even in uh, correcting the mistakes, both in man, in the minister, and both in the wife's min uh, in the minister's wife, we should be careful on how we do it. I'm not saying that we should not be tactful. We should have tact but we should have wisdom from above. And if your children and uh, your wife will not go along with you, remember what we were told in 2SG, and uh, uh, this will be worth it to close with it because uh, I feel this is necessary. What we just began with is what we finish uh, with in 2SG, uh, in 2SG page uh, 266 to 267. Let us end here where we began. If your wife and your children will not move along, how should we treat them? First of all, we saw that um, you should maintain your integrity and let God approve your work. And the church should pray along with you. But again, I repeat this just to bolster it. Bolster it. I saw that those who profess the truth should hold the standard high and induce others to come up to it. Force is the last resort of every false religion. Do not force your children and your wife to be what you want them to be. I saw that some will have to walk the straight path alone. Their companions and children will not walk the self-denying pathway with them. Patience and forbearance should ever characterize the lives of those lone pilgrims following the example of their blessed master. They will have many trials to endure, but they have a hope that makes the soul strong that bears them up above the trials of earth, that elevates them above scorn, derision, and reproach. Those who possess a hope like this will never indulge a harsh and kind spirit. This will only injure their own souls and drive their friends further from the truth. Treat them tenderly, treat them tenderly. Give them no occasion to reproach the cause of Christ, but never yield the truth to please anyone. Be decided, be fixed, be established, be not of doubtful mind. But if your companions and children will not come, if you cannot win them to yield to the claims of truth, make their lives here as pleasant as possible. For all they will ever enjoy will be for all they will ever enjoy will be this poor world. But let not your duty to them interfere with your duty to God. Ministers, don't give up the work of God. Just let not your duty to your wife interfere with your duty to God. God has not told you to leave the work that you are doing. You have a gift and don't be like that man who was given one talent and went and buried it. You may bury it because your wife is not showing a good example, but God will require of you that gift that you have. Don't think that it's a, 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 a small matter. Just to say, okay, then, because my wife is not up to the standard that the church needs, then I'm not engaging myself in active labor. No, you have a gift and what you are doing, you are barring it and God will require of you. So let not their behavior uh, interfere with your duty to God. Pursue a straightforward course. Let nothing they may do or say provoke an angry word from you. You have a hope that, you, that will yield you consolation amid the disappointments and trials of life. Your companions and children who will not be induced to tread the narrow cross-bearing pathway with you have not this divine consolation. They should, have their, they should have your pity for this world is all the heaven they will have. And so 
May the Lord bless us. May the Lord bless the minister's wives. And may they be encouraged and not feel condemned by this message. Shall we pray? Our good Lord in heaven, thank you because uh, the things that you reveal unto us, they are for our salvation. They are not for condemnation. For the work of Christ is not to condemn, but to heal, to restore. And so let this message bring restoration to families which have been faltering. And Lord, may thy will just prevail that um, we shall hold pen each other into the way of righteousness and we shall not be a stumbling block to each other. Thank you for your mercies. And uh, the reason we have heard this message is because probation has still been extended for us. And so thank you again. And uh, thank you for hearing our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. And so God bless you and uh, continue guiding you until then in Jesus' name. Amen.